بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم کالو سبحان کالا علم لنا علام علام تعالیٰ انہ کا انت العلیم الحکیم ان دا لاسٹ لیکچرز وی ہیو ڈسکس اینٹامیکل اینڈ فیزیولوجیکل بیسز آف ریسپریٹی سسٹم اینڈ وی جسٹ اسٹارٹیڈ ان دا لاسٹ لیکچر اباؤٹ دا ریسپریٹی فیلیئر اور ان دس لیکچر وی ول ڈسکس لٹ بیٹ اباؤٹ ریسپریٹی فیلیئر لیڈنگ ٹو اے آر ڈی ایس and then its uh, pathophysiology and management. Now, respiratory, physio- respiratory failure, in fact, in broad term, we define it that uh, this is a system which is no longer able to meet the metabolic demands of the body. That's respiratory failure. So, it's not only related to the lung, but it's the fun- uh, function of the respiratory system which fulfills the demands of the tissue for oxygen and then circulatory system along with it uh, supplies the nutrition to the cell. So if we cannot supply the oxygen, adequate amount of oxygen for aerobic metabolism, then the patient goes into metabolic disturbance and that's called respiratory failure. In respiratory system, there are six laws which are related to respiratory system. First is Graham's law of diffusion. This is a law of diffusion through the gases media. Then second is Henry's law of diffusion. This is a diffusion of gases through the liquid media. Then third is the Dalton law of partial pressure. This is a law which is related to partial pressure of individual gas in a mixture of gases. Then Hagen Parcelli law is related to flow through the tube and it also Uh, you can through this law you can calculate the resistance you can calculate the flow and you can calculate the pressure then ohm's law also is the law relates to the pressure wall flow and the resistance also this is also applicable in the uh, respiratory system then laplace's law laplace's law is uh, if you relate the pressure to tension and the radius So this, this law is applied. This supply is mainly applied in the bladder, then in the vessel, then in the heart chamber. It's also applied in the alveoli. So its explanation is slightly different. So you should be able to explain it if you apply this, that P is equal to 2T over R. So all these laws, to understand these laws and their application is very important as far as the respiratory system is concerned. or as far as the respiratory failure is concerned. Objective or respiratory system, one of the objectives of respiratory system is to get the oxygen in the alveoli. And if the oxygen goes to the alveoli, this is called partial pressure of oxygen in the alveoli, P big A O2. So partial pressure in the alveoli is a mixture of pressures of different things like of oxygen, of water, of nitrogen, and, and all these combined together and CO2 which is coming into the alveoli. So partial pressure in the alveoli is equal to partial pressure of oxygen in the alveoli plus partial pressure of carbon dioxide in the alveoli plus partial pressure of water vapor in the alveoli plus partial pressure of nitrogen. If you combine all together that will be the partial pressure at the alveoli. Out of that, partial pressure of oxygen is, is very important because under this partial pressure, oxygen will go and diffuse through the alveolar capillary pathway into the blood and will uh, be delivered to the tissues and subsequently. Now, this partial pressure of oxygen into the alveoli is affected by alveolar pressure. What is the pressure in the alveoli? Because greater the pressure, the greater will be the pressure difference between the partial pressure of oxygen in the alveoli and partial pressure of oxygen in the blood. So, in addition to physical properties, it's a diffusing capacity. So, this oxygen will go into the blood. Then, it also depends how much is the partial pressure of carbon dioxide in the alveoli. So, because carbon dioxide will dilute the oxygen which has been delivered from atmosphere to the alveoli. then it also depends what percentage of oxygen you are giving to the person. We are breathing 21% oxygen in the air. If we are given 50%, 60%, 100%, that will affect the partial pressure of oxygen in the alveoli. So it means the partial pressure of oxygen in the alveoli is very important 
for the diffusion to go into the blood. Then it also depends on the ventilation, particularly the inspiratory phase. If you increase the inspiratory phase of ventilation, even leading to inverse ratio ventilation, the greater the inspiratory period, the greater the time will be given for the oxygen to diffuse from the alveoli to the blood. That will improve the oxygenation. So these are the things which we keep in our mind because our main objective is to deliver the oxygen to alveoli. Then alveolar capillary pathway, we look at that whether it is diffusing through it or not. Then carbon dioxide in the alveoli, that is called partial pressure of carbon dioxide in the alveoli which is coming from blood. It depends how much it accumulates in the alveoli. It depends what is the respiratory rate of a person or respiratory rate which you set on the ventilator. It also depends how much is the tidal volume in volume of gas which is going into the lung and coming out in one breath is called tidal volume. Greater the volume, the greater will be removed. If you have small tidal volume, the less carbon dioxide will be removed and that will accumulate in the alveoli and that will accumulate in the blood also. Then ventilation profusion massing, that how much is the gas is coming into the lung and how much is the blood passing through the lung in a minute. And if you take that ratio, that's very important, that's called ventilation provision ratio. The gases which are reaching into the lung per minute is 4 liters in adult and the blood which is going into the lung per minute is 5 liter. If you divide 4 liter by 5 liter, it becomes 0.8. That is the normal uh, this uh, uh, ventilation provision ratio. So we expect both lungs should have a ventilation profusion ratio of 0.8 and each lung should have 0.8 and each individual lobe should have 0.8 each alveoli should have 0.8 then we consider that the lung is normal and when the baby is born a newborn so we expect when the lung is completely distended that every part of the lung has got ventilation profusion of 0.8 and as the age patient becomes older and older, the ventilation profusion ratio changes according to the uh, changes in the aging changes in the lung. Now, what are the pathophysiological mechanisms? We normally, as the pulmonologists, divide this respiratory failure into two types, type 1 and type 2. Type 1 is if there is only oxygen is affected, hypoxemic failure. Type 2 is if there is carbon dioxide accumulation also, hypercapnic failure. Now, hypoxic failure is mainly due to decreased, could be due, due to decreased FIA2, fractional inspired oxygen concentration, or it could be there are some lungs where there is ventilation but there is no perfusion. Gases are going in but blood is not going there. Then. Third is, if there is a provision, blood is going, but there is no gas going into the lung. Then third is, diffusion abnormality. Now gases which has gone into the alveoli, it has to pass through the alveolar epithelium, then interstitial compartment, then capillary endothelium, then into the plasma, then will combine with the hemoglobin. This is called alveolar capillary pathway. So if there is edema in the lung, that will increase the alveolar capillary pathway. If there is interstitial edema, that will also increase the uh, alveolar capillary pathway. If there is closure of the capillaries or if the capillaries are not ready to take up the oxygen, that will also affect the diffusion of gases from the alveoli to the blood. So this is called alveolar capillary pathway and this is called diffusion of gases from the alveoli to the blood and it works under the effect of Henry's law of diffusion in addition to pressure gradient. So, these things we will have to keep in mind in hypoxemic failure. In hypercapnic failure, one cause could be hypoventilation. Patient is not breathing properly, respiratory rate is low, or tidal volume is low. That will let the carbon dioxide accumulate in the alveoli. Second is shunting of the blood. Blood is coming into the lung, but it is not coming in contact with the uh, gases. So, could be partly then we have to calculate the shunt, QS over QT, is the blood which has, is not coming in contact with the gases divided by the total amount of blood which is coming into the lung. That's called shunt, shunt, how normal shunt is about 
3 to 4 percent or 5 percent. But if it goes on increasing, so then we'll have to find out what is the cause. What is the cause of shunting? And that is one of the most important causes of hypercapnic failure. Now, clinically, how will the patient present if the patient goes into respiratory failure? So, signs of respiratory compensation like patient get tachypnea. Tachypnea is increase in respiratory rate, right? Then there is apropnea and apnea and other things also. And if you look at the patient, patient must be using accessory muscle of respiration. Then third thing is, if you stand on the foot and set of the patient, always when you are examining the patient, you stand on the foot and side to see how the patient is breathing. You look at the breathing pattern and then you look at on the whole whether the patient is using excessive muscles or not. And the immediate thing, early respiratory failure, you will see the flaring of the nasi, ali nasi. So that will give you indication the patient is distressed. Even if looking at the chest, uh, you see that patient breathing normally, but this is early sign. So you can only see it when you're sitting on the foot and so the bed. Always make your habit when you're examining a patient, stand on, stand on the foot and side first and, the, and raise the head of the patient. And then you examine it, how the patient is breathing. So then due to accumulation of carbon dioxide, particularly and hypoxia, if it goes up to 60 milliliter mercury, that stimulates the sympathetic system. Stimulate sympathetic system will be, patient will have tachycardia, increase in heart rate. And that might take the patient into hypertension, high blood pressure. Then due to stimulation of postganglionic sympathetic cardiac fiber, there will be sweating. I could say like this, there will be a sweating. But what is the cause of sweating? Sweating is always due to stimulation of postganglionic sympathetic cardiac fiber. So, so that is stimulated because of sympathetic nervous system stimulation. Then you look at the end organ failure. End organ failure because it's affecting hypoxia and hypercarbia is affecting all the cells of the body. So it will be affecting the cells of the brain also. So there will be altered mental state first of all and then patient might go in a later stage instead of tachycardia can go into bradycardia because of depression of the myocardium. Then patient starts going into uh, lowering of the blood pressure. Patient goes into hypertension because hypo hypoxia and hypercarbia both cause peripheral vasodilatation. Because blood pressure is nothing but cardiac output into peripheral resistance. So the peripheral resistance will be dropped so the blood pressure starts going down. Right? And hypoxia and hypercarbia both cause pulmonary vasoconstriction also. So there will be pulmonary hypertension with systemic hypotension. Then you look at the hemoglobin saturation. Patient will be cyanosed if the patient goes into respiratory failure. Cyanosis is indicated when there is more than 5 grams of hemoglobin is, is, uh, is not combining with the oxygen. So that is cyanosis. It means a person is anemic who has got low hemoglobin. There are low chances of getting cyanosis as compared to the person who has got high normal or high level of hemoglobin. They tend to go into cyanosis quickly because it is a strict formula that there should be reduced hemoglobin at least of 5 grams per 100 cc. Right? Then along this, if you understand what is methemoglobin and this normal oxygen which is carried by hemoglobin is called oxygenation. When it undergoes chemical reaction then it is called oxidation and oxidation is will have to convert the oxidation into normal oxygenation so or we will have to reduce the ox oxidated hemoglobin. So that is called methemoglobin. Methemoglobin is oxidated hemoglobin. The carriage, normal carriage of oxygen is called oxygenation or oxygenated hemoglobin, right? The typical question which I asked in Viva also. Now, when the patient goes into advanced respiratory failure, then we say the patient is going into ARDS, adult respiratory distress syndrome. So, by definition, in addition to having a a respiratory system failure to meet the de metabolic demands of the body. There will be refractory hypoxemia, 
plus there will be non cardiogenic pulmonary edema if you look at the x ray and then you look at the abg so you immediately pick up that patient is going into ards it's very easy to diagnose and very difficult to manage because in addition to respiratory centers respiratory cells pneumocytes so there are 40 types of cells they are all disturbed they produce different type of uh, chemical substances which we have discussed in the last lecture also so then we have to control according to stimulation of the cell now these are the people who have done a lot of work on this so i know most of them I have been attending the conference belgian conference they they go there and they present their paper the papers which are presented in the brussel every third week of march so those papers after few years they come into the books so the, at least 10 years later they come into the books so the, these are the things which are discussed over there now what is there will be two mechanisms for ards one is direct insult of lung there is thing which is causing damage of the lung it is a direct injury and there could be effect of systemic inflammatory response of the body to sepsis or to any other things that affects the lung also so there will be there are substances there are triggers which affect the lung directly or there are other substances which are produced through systemic inflammatory response they affect the lung also damage the lung there are two things so first stage is acute lung injury when immediately this respiratory failure starts to so say the patient is going into acute lung injury leading to acute respiratory distress syndrome ards so it goes like that first of all there is acute lung injury then goes into full fledged ards now acute yeah so typical clinical condition which trigger the direct injury is called aspiration you see the patient who has come upstairs from icu and they are on feeding and they get aspirated and they are the candidate they can go into ards if it is not controlled properly then near drowning one is a drowning or is near a drowning is a, a separate topic then smoke or toxic chemical substances which go and damage and cause the direct damage to the uh, respiratory system then pulmonary contusion pulmonary contusion could be multiple injury which road is road side accident then pneumonia infective pneumonia so pneumonia can be low bar or bronchial pneumonia so that can lead to if it is not treated properly or the patient is not responding properly to your ordinary management they 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 can cause ards indirect like prolonged or severe shock sepsis pancreatitis massive transfusion fat embolism and cardiopulmonary bypass cardiopulmonary bypass uh, is not a simple thing so that can cause ards also now to differentiate between ali and ards ali of acute onset immediately first thing which will happen will be the it will be onset will be acute then we look at the oxygenation we look at the ratio of partial pressure of oxygen in the alveoli divided by fio2 fractional inspired oxygen concentration if this ratio is less than 300 then we say the patient is gone into ali but greater than 200 normally it should be greater than 300 up to 500 but if it is less than 300 this ratio but more than 200 we say the patient has gone into acute lung injury ali then cardiacly uh, no apparent cardiogenic edema then risk factor is known triggering event on risk factors we have to look at that but the dividing thing between the ali and the ards is the ratio ratio of partial pressure of oxygen uh, in the blood divided by the fio2 fio2 mean for example if you are giving 60% to a person we can write down 60% but we can represent it like 0.6 as we are taking oxygen 20% so it can be right it can be written like this 0.2 2 but divided by 10 that will be 1/5 so you 
you put that FIO2 as not a 60%, 70%, 80%, you put point, is it, 0 0.6, 0 0.2, 0 0.5. Then you divide, for example, the PO2 is 100, 100 divided by air, 2, 0.2. So you can calculate it becomes 500. So the normal uh, PO2 over FIO2 ratio is 500. If it comes down to 300, it remains normal. Once the less than 300, but more than 200, then patient has gone into air line. Then if it is less than 200, then patient is in ARDS. So you see the patient in intensive care every day. So this is the first thing we look at it. In our ABG, they have already calculated, but you can calculate yourself also. Now in ARDS, this ratio is less than 200. So although the management starts from ALI, even before that we start the management. There are two stages when this condition develops, the early stages and the later stages. In early stage, what happens? There will be alveolar edema. When there is alveolar edema, then very little air, the, air, the portion of the lung through which the gas passes will be reduced. A rated portion of the lung will be, volume will be decreased. So there will be less capacity for the gases to be kept in the alveoli. Then it will, this fluid which accumulates in the alveoli, that reduces the activity of surfactant. It does not reduce the production of surfactant at this stage, but it reduces the activity of surfactant. When surfactant activity is reduced, then the compliance is reduced. Compliance is nothing, volume change, but you not change the pressure. The alveoli starts closing. So, although it is not because of less production of surfactant, but it is the less efficiency of surfactant which has been done by the water which has collected, by the edema which has collected in the lung. Then gas exchange abnormality starts. Then lung starts collapsing. And if it is severe collapsing, then there will be consolidation starting on it. Now, time constant, time constant is nothing but is a product of compliance and resistance. So that will be increased. Then increase inflation of non-dependent lung. Because as the fluid collects in the lower portion of the lung, so the upper portion of the lung can accommodate gases more. So if you are ventilating such patient, the less gases will be going into lower part of the lung because there is edema. The more than normal will be going into the upper part of the lung. If more than normal amount of gases go into the upper lung, it will disturb the ventilation perfusion ratio. It will be dead space effect in the upper part of the lung and the, uh, this shunting effect in the lower part of the lung. So this becomes ineffective. Your ventilation does not remain that effective. We will have to consider this, how to adjust the ventilation to adjust according to the ventilation perfusion of the lung. At a later stage, now surfactant synthesis is affected. Now there is a less production of surfactant. When there is less production of uh, surfactant, there will be reduction of compliance. If there is a reduction of compliance, so LRI will not be able to distend by the ordinary volume of gas which we are putting in the lung or the patient breathing through. So it means there will be less volume of gas going into the lung, less will be diffusing through it, and the less oxygen will be going to combine with hemoglobin. So that will cause a uh, problem. Then airway resistance, because in the later stage there is edema of conducting pathway also, particularly at the respiratory bronchial type. That way. So that will, if you uh, have the edema of the epithelial cell, so it will reduce the caliber of the vessel. If you reduce the caliber of the vessel, it will take longer time for the gases to pass through it, because it flow of the gases will be reduced. According to Hagen Poiseuille law, their flow is directly proportional to the fourth power of the radius. So if you reduce it by two, so it will reduce the flow by 16, one by 16. If it will increase the radius by uh, two times, it will increase 16 times flow through it. So that is Hagen Poiseuille law which applies over here. Then there will be arterial hypoxemia consequently and if there is arterial hypoxemia, it is because of increased shunting of the blood. 
because the blood does not come in contact with the gases the blood is flowing mainly dependent part of the lung not in the upper part of the lung the gases are mainly going into the upper part of the lung and the blood is not going to upper part of the lung so because of this the blood will be shunted and there will be dead space effect so ventilation perfusion ratio will be decreased and consequently effect will be that there will be hypoxia and at the same time vd over vt ratio is increased also there will be dead space effect because the dead space effect the carbon dioxide cannot come out it will cause hypercarbia so in addition to hypoxia it will cause hypercarbia these are very sequent in in the same way the, all these sequences go one by one but if you understand what is the time constant you can understand the whole uh, pathophysiology of lung time constant is nothing but is a product of uh, compliance and the resistance and the time constant according to physics law is the time required to fill any vessel up to 67% of its capacity that is called one time constant up 67% how much is left then from 100% is 33 and if you uh, fill the 67% of this 33% that is the two time constant so it goes like this so the, in the lung my professor used to say mom tells remember only time constant if you remember the time constant you know the physiology of lung is nothing but a product of compliance and resistance now there are different stages of acute respiratory failure or uh, ARDS now it can be divided normally there is at room air if you are breathing room air we expect the PO2 should be between 100 80 and 100 mm mercury and uh, a gradient pco2 is around about 35 to 40 and a a gradient a ratio that is partial pressure of oxygen in the alveoli minus partial pressure of oxygen in the blood if you take at the difference normal is about 5 to 10 so this should be in a normal person if you send your blood if you are a normal so you will see these parameters there your po2 should be around about 100 by at least should be greater than 80 but if your lungs are good it should be around about 100 then a ratio a gradient should be around about 5 to 10 and pco2 and P, pco2 should be between 35 to 40 and then if you look at the normal shunting there is a blood 5% 5 to 8% of the blood does not come in contact with the gases that's the shunting of the blood is about 5 to 8% is normal moreover there are some veins thrombin veins which are coming directly into the heart they also uh, are included in shunting of the blood now first stage when the patient lung is affected first stage stage is called stage of injury and resuscitation at this stage clinically there is no evidence patient looks normal then uh, chest x ray that that is normal if you look at the po2 that starts going down it goes down to 70 to 90 right that should give you indication there is something going on in the lung then if you look at the pco2 it it is also reduced because patient is breathing slightly breathing faster passing out co2 it co2 comes down to 30 to 40 then a gradient increases a a a gradient will be increased to 20 to 40 then you look at the shunt it is a 10 to 20 although patient looks normal although there is no evidence in the lung but if you look at this parameter that should give you that should structure your head that is something going in the lung and the patient is going towards the ards and this is the first stage which is called stage of injury and resuscitation and you should take up the step at this stage if you take up the step at this stage then recovery is very good if you bigger longer you take to take up the step the less will be the recovery the second is subclinical respiratory distress there will be moderate mild to moderate tachypnea the patient starts breathing a little bit fast then you look at the accident there will be minimal or no infiltration there might be a little bit of infiltration in the lower part of the lung then if you look at the po2 it has further come down to 60 then if you look at the pco2 it has been further it has further come down to 25 to 30 or 25 to uh, 
then that should give you indication that patient is really aggravating washing out the CO2. Then you look at the A gradient, it has gone up 30 to 50. When the gases are reaching the envelope but are not passing through alveolar capillary pathway, is not going into the blood. So that again should strike your head that there is something serious going on. Then if you can measure the QS over QT, that is shunting, it has increased to 20 to 12 to 25. Then third stage is established respiratory distress. Now respiratory distress has been established, increasing tachypneum, then edema infiltration appears on the lungs, then PO2 has come down to 50, 50 to 60, then PCO2 has gone down to 20. He's washing out CO2 very fast. Then if you look at the A gradient, it is a 40 to 60, and then the shunt has increased to 20 to 40. So, so it's like this, gradually it goes. So it means why we are making these stages, because you should be aware that these patients can go into ideas, why not to pick it up earlier at this stage. The earlier you pick up, the best will be the result. So you should not be just sitting, the lung is normal and the patient is okay. But no, look at the blood gases. They will give you the indication. What is the PO2 like? What is the PC2 like? What is the A gradient? What is shunting? That blood gases will tell you. So the longer you wait, so you will have problem then. Then last of all, the severe respiratory distress. They also again divide into three subgroups also. But if you remember these things only, it can give you indication the patient has gone gradually into full-fledged respiratory failure. That is ARDS. Cardinal clinical presentation. Patient will be severely respiratory distressed, severe hypoxemia. That is because of alveoloedemia. That is because of regional ventilation perfusion defect, because of factors reducing PVO2, and also because of decreased oxygen consumption. And then also because of decreased cardiac output and also because of decreased hemoglobin. All these factors lead to uh, uh, reducing PVO2. Then bilateral diffuse infiltration in the both lung and pulmonary edema and there will be pulmonary barotrauma also. Sometimes if you are ventilating, it will cause bursting of the alveoli and that will cause pneumothorax, pulmonary barotrauma. We will discuss this later on. So what are the actually important parameters you have to look at these patients is, first is the blood gases. We immediately do the ABGs and you look at the oxygenation, ACE-based status, then oxygenation status. And you also take the venous blood also. So you look at the oxygenation status and uh, you look at the blood gases and then see, take the difference of ABGs of venous blood and arterial blood. That will give you a lot of clue. Then you look at the lactate also. Then A gradient is very important. You calculate yourself. All the blood gas analyzers, they don't mention about A gradient. But if you know the partial pressure of oxygen, the alveoli partial pressure of oxygen in the um, uh, blood, then you can make the A gradient yourself. And how to measure the partial pressure of oxygen in the alveoli, that's again very easy to do it. Then you calculate the shunt fraction also. So these are three important things which you should do to confirm your diagnosis and to look at the gravity of situation also. Once they get the blood gases, second is the A gradient and third is the shunt fraction. Now if you come to the management, I'm quickly passing through this, control of parent problem, review the cause. Right? What is the cause to control the parent problem? What is the causative factor? If you can find out. Second is progressive dehydration. As the lungs are wet, progressive dehydration is nothing. You take the person into negative while keeping the hemodynamics normal. You, because you have got a vessel, then you have got interstitial compartment, you have got intercellular compartment. You fill the body from inside out. Fill the vessel first then the intercellular compartment, then the cell compartment. But in progressive dehydration, so you keep the circulation normal, so that the blood central venous pressure should be normal, blood pressure should be normal, periphery should be warm. Because this is the system which is going to take up the oxygen from the lung, and this is the system which is going to take the nutrition to the cell, 
to keep the metabolic activity of the cell. So if you keep this system normal, extract the water from the area which is outside the vessel. That's the interstitial compartment, intercellular uh, compartment. There is edema. You take the person into negative while taking that water out, but keep the circulation normal. This is called progressive dehydration. You take into 1 to 1.5 liter every day, negative. You can typically see this progressive dehydration which we do in the pre eclamptic and eclamptic patients also. There are only two indications of progressive dehydration. One is ARDS and other is pre eclampsia toxemia of pregnancy. So in the toxemia of pregnancy also we do like this also. We keep the circulation normal and we extract the water which has accumulated in the intercellular compartment and intercellular compartment. Then third thing which we do is optimize the distension of alluli. Keep the alluli open. Don't let them be closed because then there will be atelectasis and then there will be consolidation on top of that. So keep them distended. How can you keep them distended? There are steps. Before going on to full fledged ventilation, there are steps. We put them on PEEP, CPAP, we put them on BiPAP. Before that, we give them high flow oxygen. High flow oxygen is not an oxygen which we are giving ordinarily to the person. We start with 15 liters of oxygen and put mask there and then some another reservoir bag. This is not high flow oxygen. So, high flow oxygen is which is given with a high pressure and its pressure should be greater than the inspirative, peak inspiratory pressure. How much is the peak inspiratory pressure? The gas which are going into the lung, if I'm breathing like this, and 500 ml is going into my lung, so, but at what pressure it is going? At what speed it is going? So that's important. It's not even pressure, it is the speed or the flow. So that is about peak inspiratory flow rate normally is, 20 to 40 liter per minute. So we have got the operators now, DJ, in our ICU. This is, we can take up the flow up to 50 liters and 60 liters also. And that will keep the alveoli distended because flow is much greater than the peak inspiratory flow rate. Then nursing care in this. Coughing, deep breathing, nebulization, this comes in nursing care, right? So this is very important for these patients. Now, these individual things which I am telling, the things which I have told already, control of parent problem, progressive dehydration, optimization, distension of alveoli. So these are individual topics. We can go into depth. So because I am giving just general lecture on the ARDS, so I have to skip over it. Then second part is the nursing care. In nursing care is very important in intensive care patients who are nurses who are dealing with it because the nurses are the main persons who uh, look after the patient or by whom care the patients come out of the hospital also. Upright, not uh, transverse. So the nursing care is the key, key to treatment, key to management in hospital. So like coughing, deep breathing, and nebulization. Then position changes, lateral position, supine position, prone position. So this different position has got a different effect on the lung, which we will discuss later on what are the mainly is the prone position, which is very important. Then head elevation, any patient who comes in ICU should have a normally 25 to 30 degree up, but particularly head injury patient or the patients who have got in brain insult should be 35 to 45 degree. And if same is here in the ARDS patient, respiratory failure, their head should be between 35 and 45 degree really like this. So that it should take away the pressure which is on the diaphragm. Take away the pressure of abdominal content on the diaphragm so that the lungs should not be collapsed and it should, the patient should have very less resistance for the breathing in. Then chest physiotherapy, also very important part of it, chest physiotherapy. So these are the four things. And the fifth thing is a proper nursing care of the patient, proper care of the bed also. Bedding and other things are also included in the nursing care. In, then there is general care. General care control the infection, if you know it. Otherwise, any patient who comes with a fever or there is an indication there is an infection, you always send the blood and all the secretions for the 
culture and sensitivity before you start start the antibiotics on a system based okay, what should be the priority of infection in the what should be the priority of antibiotic in the first priority second priority in the chest infection what should be the priority in the liver failure or what should be the priority in the abdominal sepsis what should be the priority from on the uh, uh, any sort of wound so it's all protocols are given in icu so accordingly we give first priority second priority third priority till we get the result of cultural sensitivity but before you start the antibiotic take the blood sent for culture you know, it's a standard then you let uh, fever control the fever pain and restlessness and control all these things fever pain and restlessness they increase the oxy requirement at a cell level so on the one hand we are not getting enough amount of oxygen into the uh, into the body because patient is in respiratory failure on the other hand if you increase the requirement so you are doubly at loss so there will be more a anaerobic metabolism and there will be more lactate production then there will be patient going into metabolic acidosis then try to reduce the abdominal distension how can you reduce it you will have to look at whether the patient is passing stool or not then you look at you have put the nasogastric tube in and you are uh, uh, sucking it and you are taking the secretions out so because this distension of abdomen will put a pressure on the diaphragm and that will push put the pressure on the lower part of the lung and that will enhance the atelectasis and that will enhance the shunting of the blood so that's very important also if there is indication that there is a fluid in the lung do thorough synthesis take the fluid out if it is even if small amount ask the ultrasonologist to take it out otherwise we do we ourselves also we put a tube over there small tube and drain it out because we want to keep the lung aerated now progressive dehydration as i told you so in progressive dehydration take the water out of the interstitial compartment intercellular compartment take them into negative and what should be the choice of fluid the choice of fluid should be such a fluid which remain in the vessel which type of fluid will remain in the vessel the fluid which has got colloid activity it does not go out of the pores of the vessel capillary vessel so we try to give them blood plasma or plasma substitutes like emexil then there are so many choices also our objective in this patient is to take their osmolality up to 320 milli osmoles per liter serum osmolality now the osmolality of blood is 285 to 295 and its main contributor to this osmolality is sodium because our normal sodium level is 140 and same number of anions will be amount of anion will be attached with it so 140 plus 140 is 280 out of 285 to 295 is the contribution of the sodium so keep an eye on the sodium level then you give such a fluid which can raise the osmolality also and we can go up to 320 it will extract the fluid which have accumulated intracellularly if the fluid will start coming from intracellular to interstitial compartment then from interstitial compartment into intravascular compartment then it will be washed out and pass through the uh, kidney but we keep an eye don't take them into in a, such a negative way that it should drop the blood volume blood volume should be kept normal and the cardiac output should remain normal vessel should remain dilated so that the oxygen and the nutrition should be available to the tissues right drugs which we use in our days we use there is bronchodilators right okay? bronchodilators acting through the nervous system and out of nervous system we choose the bronchodilators which are sympathetic stimulant or parasympathetic like salbutamol sympathetic drug or uh, parasympathetic is ipratropine or atropine like thing yeah then we give such a drug which has got direct uh, smooth muscle relaxant like amenophilin and other things also and at the same time we try to reduce the edema of the uh, conductive pathway of the uh, respiratory tract particularly at the respiratory bronchial level and we extract the water out of that that we given by steam inhalation and on and nebulization is below the respiratory field uh, respiratory 
bronchiole. Below the respiratory bronchiole is the respiratory part of lung. And above the respiratory bronchiole is the conductive pathway. For the conductive pathway, we do the steam inhalation with the saline steam inhalation. And for uh, reducing the edema and causing dilatation is below the respiratory uh, tract is by nebulization. Because the difference between steam inhalation and nebulization is nebulization, the molecule of uh, steam should be less than 0.2 micron. If it is greater than 0.2 micron, it will precipitate on the conducting pathway. So, people, most of the people don't understand even this thing. What is the difference between nebulization and steam inhalation? Steam inhalation is for a conducting pathway. Nebulization is below the conducting pathway or respiratory part of the lung. Then, use of anotropes if it is required. If the hemodynamics is not stable, so we give them anotropic agent or vasopressor agent. Anotropes are drugs which increase the contractility of the myocardium and vasopressor which cause vasoconstriction. So if it is required, if there is indication for a particular one, we use that. Then the steroids, low dose regime. Low dose means 100 milligram 8 hourly. There is no use given that 250, 300, 400, something like that which people prescribe it, they are useless. But it has been standard, uh, uh, experiment has been done, it's only 100 milligram, it only is the most effective dose. Why we give the steroid, what the steroids do? Normally we have got the steroid level in our body. Now the blood level of steroids, from where the steroids come? From the adrenal gland. Which part of the adrenal gland? From the adrenal cortex. So there are three layers, oligoclum, vellosa, fasciculata and reticularis. They secrete different, synthesize and secrete different types of steroids. And it's the outer layer and the inner layer of adrenal medulla is, uh, adrenal gland is the medulla. And they synthesize catecholamines. And for the synthesis of catecholamine and the release of catecholamine, you re require the steroid to pass through it. That's why outer, outer is the cortex and inside is the medulla. Now those steroids, First of all, they are required to increase the synthesis and release of catecholamine. Secondly, they sensitize the uh, adrenoceptors to the effect of catecholamine. Third thing is open up the post capillary sphincter. Fourth thing is it is antioxidant also. So for these things, if to these patients, we give steroids to septic patients. Then inhalation therapy, depending on what sort of inhalation therapy you want to use. You want to use some drugs with it or not. Then respiratory care. If the patient, patient goes on deteriorating in spite of your management, now we look at the respiratory care also. Does they require only airway maintenance and second is ventilatory assistance? You'll have to decide yourself depending on the biochemical report. What type of respiratory assistance the patient requires? Now ventilatory assistance is mechanical ventilatory support. Right. So it allows the time for lungs to heal and treats hypoxemia. Why we need the ventilatory support? And it worsens the lung injury. Always remember it when you put the patient on a ventilator or you give ventilatory support. It is against the natural way of breathing. If you have got respiration and the other is a ventilation, there are in dono me farka. Respiration, we are breathing. Breathing is two types. Respiration and ventilation. Respiration is a negative pressure breathing and ventilation is positive pressure breathing. When we breathe in, we, our inspiratory muscles contract, they pull out the chest wall and they create the negative pressure in the pulmonary cavity. Then they create the negative pressure in the lung, subatomic pressure. Due to pressure reduction in the lung, yeah. as compared to abrasive pressure, gases go in. So it means a negative pressure sucks the gases in. When the inspiratory muscle stop contracting, then the chest recoil back and there is a positive pressure. And due to pressure gradient, again the gases come out. This is called respiration. And this type of respiration can be artificially given by devices which are called respirators. The things which we are using in our ICU or our ICU, these are called ventilators. Not respirators. In old time, the QRAS respirator and other things used to be there. 
but those are respirator now these are a ventilator with ventilator we create a positive pressure on the mouth on nose or in the tube and due to pressure gradient the gases go inside the lung because there is higher pressure outside than the inside so that which is the gas in this is called ventilation so ventilation is against the natural process of breathing now it is bound to cause some problem anything which goes against the nature it is bound to cause a problem so always when you put these patients on on ventilator you should remember it it can cause the injury to the mucosa of the lung and it can cause three things barotrauma volutrauma and third thing is biotrauma three things which we will discuss later on what are these barotrauma volutrauma and uh, biotrauma now but putting on ventilator is for the benefit because the benefit we want we want to improve the oxygenation and we want to remove the carbon dioxide that is whole objective right main objective is to improve the oxygenation we don't care about carbon dioxide also because in some patient we built up the carbon dioxide also sometimes this is called permissive hypercapnia intentionally we increase the carbon dioxide because we want to ventilate with a low tidal volume so that there should not be any trauma so the main goal is maintain the gas exchange maintain the tissue oxygenation avoid adverse reaction